Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City uh, Public Library. Uh, and it's another Pulitzer Prize winning night here at the Kansas City Public Library. We do this night after night. I know it's getting boring for some of you. Um, we had last week, you know, we had uh, uh, Richard Ford as part of uh, Whitney Terrell's uh, UMKC's Writers at Work uh, series. Richard Ford won the National Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize, and, and, uh, and tonight, of course, we have Hedrick Smith, uh, who's won not one, but two Pulitzer Prizes, having participated in the Pentagon Papers uh, Pulitzer Prize and having won his own Pulitzer Prize uh, for his work on, uh, on Russia. And I, I told him, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sad that last night I didn't have my usual really complete five hours of sleep, only four and a half, and and so I got up this morning and I forgot to look in my stack of books on Russia for my vintage copy, my first edition of the paperback edition of The Russians, which is actually one of the best books ever written about Russia, which was written by uh, by Hedrick Smith when when he was the New York Times Russian uh, correspondent uh, in uh, in that country far away. Um, uh, so I can't show it to you that I prove it that, I, that I've got it. He, as an investigative journalist, he's already questioned the uh, reality of this copy, um, <laughs> but uh, but I assure you it exists at 1800 Central. Anyway, um, I have a, a particular uh, interest in uh, in this topic. Um, Hedrick Smith, in this book, Who Stole the American Dream, that he'll be talking about tonight, talks about a lot of people that I know, or at least knew and encountered uh, in my days as a, a banker, people like Alan Greenspan. Uh, and uh, I, I can remember I have my own story, which I'll lay on you now as part of my introduction uh, of Hedrick Smith, my own Alan Greenspan story, which Rick Smith will understand. It, it, it parallels a lot of the stories he tells in here. So in, I can't remember, it was late 18, uh, 1999, could have been 1899, given how old I feel. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Yeah, do I really look that, yeah. Um, uh, 1999, early 2000, I was still president of UMB in St. Louis, and the Federal Reserve had a meeting with Alan Greenspan. There were about 20 of us who had breakfast with Alan Greenspan. And so in the year 2000, a little, a little early actually in the, in the cycle of these things, um, I, I got to ask Alan Greenspan one question. And I said, Mr. Greenspan, aren't you a little worried about the mortgage market? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have taken pretty much all the equity uh, out of the mortgage market. The mortgage market is becoming bigger uh, than the treasury market. Now you can control the treasury market with interest rates and whatnot, but you really don't have that much influence on the mortgage market and standards have gone to hell and it's become bigger than the treasury market. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and banks are loading up on this stuff, and there are all these secondary markets that seem out of control. And I said, "Aren't you worried about it?" And Alan Greenspan, in a detailed, comprehensive answer to me, said, "No." <laughs> I think that pretty much explains our problem. And so Rick and I will, can now go drink in a bar somewhere, and you can talk about it. no. Um, uh, you know, this is this is still one of the most important subjects in America, uh, which is how did we get into this mess and how do we get out of this mess? And the mess is much larger than the late unpleasantness and the uh, uh, the, the things that happened in the mortgage market and the things that happened in the in the housing crisis. Uh, and whether you're you're part of the one percent or part of the ninety nine percent, or as my daughter Susie, who works at UMB now, likes to say, are part of the five percent who actually understand economics. Um, uh, this is something, this is a subject that we all have to understand and we all have to become passionate about. The great thing about Hedrick Smith's book, Who Stole the American Dream, about his previous books, uh, his book about power in America, his book about rethinking America, um, uh, is, is that he still has that passion, uh, the passion that won him uh, Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, and makes him one of the great reporters uh, of our time. I don't, as a former banker, completely agree with either his analysis or his solutions, um, uh, but what I do agree with is his engagement uh, with this. Uh, we all have to be engaged. We can't sit back and, and, and let, you know, he talks about GE during the course of this book, and, and General Electric it's a local story. It's an interesting story. General Electric doesn't pay any taxes. You know, you all pay taxes, I pay taxes, General Electric doesn't pay any taxes, and it's because they've manipulated the system, and they have manipulated the system so that their, their tax credits for 
for this and tax subsidies for that. So they'd end up not paying any taxes. Most of their money during the, the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, before, before the late unpleasantness, was actually made in Kansas City. It may not be a story that you know. They bought a, a company called Employers Reinsurance. It was a Kansas City company, became General Electric Reinsurance. They manipulated uh, Employers Re, which was a great, solid uh, reinsurance company. They, you know, they, re they insured the insurance companies. Um, it was a great conservative company, and General Electric changed the underwriting standards, made a huge amount of money for about two decades, and then the unpleasantness happened, and they lost a huge amount of money. It almost broke General Electric. They became, instead of being a manufacturing company, and this is one of the points of, uh, of Hedrick Smith's book, instead of being a manufacturing company, they became a finance company. And they screwed up a really great company that people in this community had built. And there's something wrong with that. And as I say, I might agree or disagree, maybe when the question and answer session we can get to that, uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, the analysis or the, or the solution to that, but that there is a problem with that, that it is a change in America uh, is, is, is one of the insights that Hedrick Smith has that, that is completely and absolutely true. And so, it is a great pleasure for me to, to introduce a man who is one of the premier reporters uh, for the New York Times and, and, and uh, on television and uh, in many, in many uh, theaters uh, uh, in this country, many, many theaters of endeavor in this country, who's won two Pulitzer Prizes uh, and, uh, and who is a great writer and who cares deeply about our country, ladies and gentlemen, Hedrick Smith. Thank you, Crosby. I appreciate your kind comments. I still want to see that book. Um, I, I thought for a moment here that Crosby was going to do this thing, and I was going to, I was, I was, <laughs> I was going to be able to get out of here and just sit, maybe sip on some wine and kind of take it easy. That coming to Kansas City is just a piece of cake. Um, I've been here before. I came for the convention when you had the Republican convention here. I've come down here to the Kauffman Foundation. I have friends here. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I appreciate so many of you coming out tonight. I had a wonderful conversation this morning with Steve Kraske on your fine NPR station. I don't know whether or not any of you heard it, but it was, you know, you can tell when, when the, the picture's good and, the, and, the, and you're swinging the bat right. It was just a wonderful exchange and a wonderful audience out there. And uh, it's a great thrill to, to engage with people, and I have a feeling we'll do that tonight. I got into this book because, like a lot of people back in late 2009, I was worried about where the country was, and I was thinking about my next documentary. At that point, I was making documentaries for PBS. And I was looking at the housing crisis, and, and David Fanning, who, had, who is the executive producer at Frontline, PBS Frontline, said, Rick, we've got to have you do something on subprime. And, and so I started to look into the subprime. Well, I got into the thing, and it reminded me of that, that uh, cartoon of Peanuts. You know, it's the one where Lucy has set up a card table in the backyard, and it's a psychiatry one cent. And you know who walks up, of course. Charlie Brown walks up. He puts his penny on the table, and Lucy says, well, before I can give you any advice, Charlie, she said, I have to have you think of life as a voyage on a great ocean liner. Now, there's some people who take their deck chairs up to the bow to see where they're going. And there are other people, and they take their deck chairs to the stern to see where they've been. Which group do you belong to? And Charlie scratched his head for a moment. He said, Lucy, I'm having trouble getting my chair unfolded. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we were in late 2009. Well, I started looking into this, into this thing, and I have to be honest with you, the, the, the book that I signed a contract with Random House for was not called Who Stole the American Dream. It was The Dream at Risk. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea about the stealing of the dream. I wanted to try to understand what had happened to the dream. How do we go on as a country from a time that I knew from my own life and my own experience where the middle class shared in the prosperity of the country and the growth of the country, and where the middle class was active politically, the middle class exercised power, Washington listened to the middle class. And we actually had bipartisan politics, believe it or not, that worked, yeah. Johnson and Nixon and those folks all fought, but they did actually pass legislation, Medicare, civil rights, budgets, whatever. Some things got done. And when one, off, one, one team left, 
Washington and the other took over, they didn't immediately try to undo what the last team did. They tried to do their own things, and maybe they modified them a bit, but they didn't try to undo it all. Not, not like today. How do we go from that to gridlock and polarized politics and gaping, just unbelievable inequalities in the economy, middle class stuck in the rut, American economy stuck in the rut. How did this happen? And I have to say, I was both thrilled and, and embarrassed at the discoveries I began to make. After all, I've been running the New York Times Washington Bureau in the late, in the late 70s and on into the 80s, been the chief Washington correspondent. And there were a whole bunch of things that I began to find out that I didn't know. I didn't feel very good about my reporting, but I, I, you know, even on the subprime crisis, I didn't realize that the main victims of subprime loans were prime borrowers. More people who were entitled to good credit ratings and good loans at decent rates were sucked into, bamboozled into, talked into, cheated into high interest rate loans with high fees and then constantly refinancing their homes than actually uh, Latinos and blacks and, and uh, people who didn't read English on the east side of LA. I didn't know that. I didn't know that homeowners actually lost six trillion dollars in their home equity while the housing boom was going on. We were taking out so many home equity loans, we were borrowing against our own mortgages, we were refinancing at such a fast clip that with the encouragement of Alan Greenspan, since his name has come up already this evening, with the encouragement of Alan Greenspan and the Fed and the, and the, and the Wall Street banks and, and our regional banks, we were, we were borrowing $750 billion a year against our equity. In the late 1980s, American homeowners owned 70% of the value of their own homes. By 2009, they owned 40% of the value of their own homes. The banks had picked up 30% of the ownership of people's homes from 2000 to 2009. Home ownership, home stock in America is worth about $20 trillion. So 30% of the ownership shifted, $6 trillion. Biggest transfer of wealth in the history of the United States. And it didn't trickle down, it geysered up. Went exactly, it defied gravity, went uphill. Well, that was a surprise to me. I had known something about the 401k plan. 401k plan was never intended as a national retirement system. It was set up as a, uh, as a profit-sharing tax-sheltered program for about a dozen companies. And only later on did it get approved so that people's ordinary salaries, part of their salaries could be contributed to it. And then the mutual fund industry began to sell it as power to the people, do your own retirement and so forth. And it took off and the corporations discovered they could sell, save an enormous amount of money by shifting the burden of paying for retirement from their own corporate books to the pocketbooks and the checkbooks of ordinary Americans. So here we have housing, enormous transfer of wealth. We have retirement, tremendous transfer of the financial responsibility, burden on the middle class. And as I started going into this thing, I said to Frontline, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna do that program on subprime. I said, I think I gotta do something about the middle class. I've gotta understand what's happening because something profound and large has happened to the middle class. I wanna tell you that, that I'm a reporter and that means I like to meet people and I like to understand their stories and I like to tell their stories. So I'm gonna be talking tonight just about numbers, but I think it really bothers me in Washington when I take part in the conversations there because it seems to me when people are talking about policy and economics, they're always talking numbers as if they're disconnected from people. I'm talking about people like Pat O'Neill. Pat O'Neill was a farm boy in Wisconsin who knew how to repair farm machinery. He looked up at the sky and he was fascinated by the planes overhead and he said, I'd love to become an airline mechanic. He became a jet airline mechanic for United Airlines. He worked in Chicago at O'Hare for 25 years and then 10 years at SeaTac in Seattle. He was up all night in all those cold, windy nights working the graveyard shift to make sure the planes were operating the next morning and safe for those of us who flew through O'Hare. And I gotta tell you, in those years, I flew through O'Hare an awful lot of times. I'm sure I flew on planes that Pat O'Neill fixed. But when Pat O'Neill got ready to retire after 35 years at United Airlines, United had hit hard times and it declared bankruptcy. Pat O'Neill got hit with what he called a triple whammo. His 401k 
plan lost about 50% of its value. His employee stock option program, into which he had put $80,000 of his own savings, had fallen to $2,000. It was just about wiped out. And when the pension that he had earned over 35 years was turned over to the PBGC, the government agency that takes over pensions for bankrupt companies, he lost $1,000 a month in his pension. So in fact, Pat O'Neill, when he got ready to retire, couldn't afford to retire. He had to go back to work. He became a long haul trucker, did that for six or seven years till his kidneys were killing him and he couldn't stand being away from his wife six nights a week. And so he went into a small business for himself and eventually uh, ran for office in Eastern Washington, got elected county commissioner. He just lost his reelection. I got a phone call from Pat O'Neill literally about a week ago. And he said, Rick, I got to tell you where I am. And I said, Pat, where are you? He said, I'm out of work. He said, I can't find a job. I've, I've sent out about, he said, Pat O'Neill is now 65. Pat O'Neill cannot imagine when he is ever going to be able to retire. He's unemployed. He's 65. He's lost the United Pension. He's now in Social Security, so he does have some money. But what he saved for and built in his lifetime is not there. It's quicksand. I'm talking about Christine Serrano, who did what people told people to do in the current age. Go get yourself a college degree. She got a degree in computer sciences from the University of Colorado. And she got herself a master's degree. Then she went to work for QWest, and then she went from QWest to IBM, and she managed uh, their computer systems, uh, their Oracle software systems, and became so good at it, they made her a trainer of other people. She trained a whole lot of other people. Uh, and then after a while, she was found out she was training a lot of people from India. And two or three months later, her boss called her in and said, you're fired. Well, they didn't say fired. You've been replaced through global reallocation of resources, which means an Indian has just taken your job. <laughs> so that's who we're talking about. So these are real people's lives, and these are people's lives who played by the rule books, did what they were supposed to do, worked hard, committed themselves, got an education. And this is where we are. And as I got looking into their stories and I got looking into the past, the subprime thing and then the 401k thing, and then the tax issue came up. While I was working on this, of course, all the argument, do you raise taxes, do you lower taxes, how do taxes affect growth? And as I began to dig back into history, and of course, what's interesting is you listen to the news today, and we had a discussion, Steve Kresge and I this morning had a discussion about the media. And in my opinion, the media has gotten way too short term. People are too worried about this news cycle, today's news. We're, not, we're bombarding you with information. You don't know where to put it. We don't know where to put it. We don't know how to understand it. I'm one of those guys who likes to figure things out, try to figure out what the framework is, what the pattern is, what the big story is, not just the little story. What's the forest, not just the trees? Well, the tax issue came up, and while I was doing my historical research, I was reminded, I had known this but forgotten it, that the high marginal tax rate under Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s was 92%. 92%. It got dropped under John F. Kennedy in the 60s to 77%. We enjoyed a growth rate of 3 or 4% a year on average during that period with those high tax rates. The tax rate, the top marginal tax rate under George W. Bush and Barack Obama in the 2000s. And I'm trying to be nonpartisan here. It doesn't matter whether they're Republicans or Democrats to me. I just want to understand what actually happened. The tax rate was 35%. In the last decade, we had the worst growth rate in seven decades with a tax rate of 35%. I said, my God, this debate about the tax, high marginal tax rate is nonsense. It's irrelevant. There's something else going on that I need to understand. So I went back into that era where the tax rate was up at 92% or 77% under Dwight Eisenhower. And what I began to, to, to see, it wasn't just my own memory, it wasn't just nostalgia, but we had shared prosperity at that time. We had something very interesting going on. Uh, I don't know if you remember Richard Nixon, who was uh, Eisenhower's vice president, went to Moscow in 1959. He had a famous kitchen debate with Nikita Khrushchev, so-called because it was in the kitchen exhibition of the American exhibition in Moscow. We were showing off to the Russians what wonderful kitchen appliances American housewives had and, and showing them how, you know, what a good standard of living the American middle class had. Now, Khrushchev got aggravated at, at, uh, at what Nixon said, and he said, we're building a classless society here in the Soviet Union. And Nixon stuck his finger right in Khrushchev's eye and he said, we already have a classless society in America. We've built it. And Nixon was exaggerating. That was propaganda. But Nixon was at something. 
And what economists call it is the great convergence. And what they mean by the great convergence is that the, the incomes of the people at the top were not that far from the incomes of the people in the middle, or not that far from the people at the bottom. Now we had poverty. We actually had less poverty back then than we have now. We got 43 million people living in poverty today in America. Uh, we didn't have anywhere near that many then, but the poverty rate wasn't as high, but we had it. We had booms and busts in the business cycle. I don't want to tell you it was Nirvana back then, but we had a sharing of prosperity that's embodied in two figures that I'm going to give you right now. The productivity of the American workforce from the end of World War II in 1945 to 1973 rose 97%, it virtually doubled. That's a phenomenal economic achievement. Country grew, country prospered, economy grew, and the salaries and incomes of people at the dead middle of the American economy rose 95%. 97% growth in productivity, 95% growth in their salaries and their incomes, which means their standard of living. In other words, dollar for dollar, people in the middle were moving up, and the economists have gone back and looked in every quintile, every 20%, the top 20%, next 20%, middle 20%, next 20%, bottom 20%, they all moved up together. You can go back and look at the figures. Phenomenal achievement. Why did that happen? How did that happen? Because that's not going on today. I'll get to today in a moment. But we need to understand that and that time or at least I did. What was going on was a couple of things. One thing was business leaders at that time, and it's really interesting to go back and read what they actually said <coughs> publicly, and they believed it and they acted on it. Charlie Wilson, who ran General Motors, Reg Jones, who ran General Electric, Frank Abrams, who ran Standard Oil of New Jersey. They believed it was their sacred trust to balance the interests of the stakeholders in the corporation. What do they mean by stakeholders? Very important words, stakeholders. They meant all the groups that have a stake in the success of the company. Obviously the owners, the shareholders, but the managers, the employees, the suppliers, the creditors, the customers. Customers depend on a company. You don't want to buy a product and not have uh, you know, somebody, GE or whoever it is, stand behind your refrigerator or whoever you buy your lawnmower for. The guarantee matters. So you have a stake in the success of that company, not just that product, but its continuation as a company and the communities in which the companies operate. The story Crosby just told about the, about the company here in Kansas City taken over by GE and then ruined by GE had an impact in Kansas City. It mattered to Kansas City, the community it was riveted in, the, it rooted in. Um, so I mean, so there was a real serious connection. These are the words that Frank Abrams used. My job as CEO is to ensure a, quote, equitable working balance among the claims of the stakeholders in the corporation. Balance them. So there was a business ethic, a business ethos, which said, share the wealth. Now, they didn't just share the wealth because they thought it was fair and nice and ethical. They thought it was smart business. Henry Ford came up with the idea of the $5 day in 1914 as a way of keeping workers on his payroll. But he also reasoned that it was smart business if they made $5 a day at that time, which is a very good pay at that time, um, roughly, certainly equal at least to 1000 maybe $1,500 a week in today's pay, they can afford to buy the Model Ts that Ford Motor Company is producing. And multiply that all through the economy and, and that's the kind of belief that you had among business leaders. Now you also had something else at work. You had the power of the middle class. Don't ever forget this. If there's one idea I can leave with you tonight, it is the importance of people power in this country. We had it then, we've lost it now, we're not going anywhere if we don't get it back. Uh, By people power, I'm talking about the civil rights movement. I'm talking about the consumer movement. I'm talking about the women's movement. I'm talking about the environmental movement. I'm talking about the labor movement. All those were manifestations of people power, of ordinary people saying, some issue matters enough to me that I'm prepared to gather together with other like-minded people, organize, demonstrate, go into the streets and demonstrate, petition Congress, phone, call, didn't have email then, 
but get on the backs of Congress. Show, at the meeting, show up at the meetings of, of, of members of Congress and senators when they come home and have their meetings with their constituents. Um, phenomenal impact. Phenomenal impact. It, it, I couldn't believe it when I went back and read the details. On April 22nd, 1970, 20 million Americans, 20 million Americans, nearly 10% of the American population, took part in demonstrations on Earth Day because they were outraged at the fouling of America's waters and America's airwaves, okay? 20 million people marched in the streets, met on college campuses, met in malls, got on the radio, had talkathons and that kind of thing. Within a year, Congress passed seven major pieces of legislation. Richard Nixon, a friend of big business who loved to buddy around with CEOs. He was no tree-hugging environmentalist. He created, set up the Environmental Protection Agency. He signed every single one of those seven pieces of legislation. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Anti-Toxic Substances Act, Clean Drinking Water Act, and on and on and on. I talked to Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the first head of the EPA, who was a friend of mine. I said, Bill, what's going on here? Did Nixon get converted? Did he have an epiphany here about the environment? He said, you know, in four years of working for Richard Nixon, he said, Nixon never once asked me about the environment. He never said, Bill, is it really bad? Is it the rivers? Is it, you know, is it the air pollution? Is it the automobile? He said, he didn't care. I said, so why did he do it? He said, Nixon was a practical politician. The people spoke, the people demanded it. It was up to the government to respond. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. Wow, what a sentence. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. That's what was going on. So, so that's what was going on back at that time. There was this exercise of people power. And labor unions, whether or not you, you like it or not, you need to think about it, labor unions were a part of that. They, the, the power of the labor unions was very important to, to establish the floor under the living standard of the middle class. It's embodied in, in many agreements, but most particularly in a, in a labor agreement between the United Auto Workers Union and General Motors call, that people now call the Treaty of Detroit. Called the Treaty of Detroit because coming out of World War II, after all the controls were lifted, there were a lot of wildcat strikes. And some businesses, like General Motors, were having trouble operating. And Charlie Wilson says, I want to get back to work. I want to get back to making cars. I want to get back to making money. And Walter Ruther, who, uh, who was the head of the United Auto Workers Union, said, all right, Mr. Wilson, we'll do that. But we want steady jobs. We want rising pay during the five-year life of this contract. We want health benefits. And for the first time in American labor history, we want a lifetime pension. We want retirement benefits. Wilson agreed, they went back to work, and that became a template for businesses all across the country. Non-union as well as union. Chrysler and Ford copied it. It got copied in the steel industry, in the rubber industry. <clears throat> I'm sure it got copied in the meatpacking industry, which you all uh, would know about here in Kansas City. I don't know about it in particular. But it got copied. All, many more non-union workers were affected by the model that was established between the United Auto Workers Union and the General Motors. So that was the underpinning. It became the norm. <clears throat> in my opinion, that was, in many ways, the embodiment of the American dream. The idea that you had a steady job, that if you worked all your lifetime like Pat O'Neill, your pay went up over your lifetime, that you got enough pay so you could afford a down payment on your house, you paid your mortgage for 30 years, by the time you retired, you owned the house that you lived in, and then you had a pension. And so you had a decent working life and a decent retirement. That is, to me, the middle class American dream. And when I talk about who stole the American dream, I'm talking about that dream and what happened to it. Now, who stole it? How did it get stolen? Well, I found some things out that I didn't expect to find out. There were there two things happened. Something happened that was very important in the economy and something happened that was very important in the political system in America. There was a power shift that took place in the American political system in the late 1970s. Now, most of us who follow politics, and lots of other people as well, tend to think of the big change occurring in 1981 after Ronald Reagan was elected and the Republicans gained control of the Senate for the first time in 34 years. And a lot did happen then. It was an important period, and I don't want to minimize that. But the real pivotal point occurred in the late 1970s when the Democrats were in control of Congress and Jimmy Carter was in the White House. And here's how it happened. 
because of the power that I was talking about, and I haven't gone into the power of the consumer movement, the regulations that, that it caused, and actually the Nixon administration uh, imposed many of those regulations, set up a number of new regulatory agencies. The power of the women's movement, which was demanding higher pay for women so the women would be paid equally with men. They made a lot of progress. They were still not at, at actual, actual equal pay, but they made a tremendous progress. I think 41 cents uh, for women to a dollar for men, up to somewhere around 63, and then 70 and 81 and so forth. A lot of progress was made. This aggravated a number of business leaders and particularly aggravated a guy named Lewis Powell. His name may be familiar to you. He was named to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon in 1972. But Powell was a corporate attorney, a major corporate attorney, so prominent he was elected president of the American Bar Association at one point. Powell was complaining about the power of the consumer movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement and so forth, labor movement, to some friends of his at the Chamber of Commerce, and they said, why don't you write it down? He did. He wrote something down, which is now known historically as the Powell Memorandum. He wrote a memorandum to the, the Chamber of Commerce, which they distributed to business leaders across the country. And basically what Powell said was this. The American free enterprise system is in mortal danger. Uh, somewhat of an exaggeration, but he said it's in mortal danger from People on the left in the academic world, from Ralph Nader in the consumer movement, from organized labor, from the women's movement, so forth, all these movements that I've been talking about. Business leaders, you are the forgotten people. You must go to Washington. You must realize that, <clears throat> that the political arena is important to your economic survival and success. You got to get engaged in Washington. Stop bickering among yourselves, pull your resources, put up money, have a long-term plan, get to Washington, identify your enemies, go after them aggressively, take the high ground. That is exactly what happened. It's amazing. Um, at the time that Powell wrote, there was no such thing as a business roundtable. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the business roundtable, but if you haven't, you should. The business roundtable is the single most powerful voice of corporate America in Washington today, political voice. Um, it didn't exist at the time that Powell wrote his memo. Four months later, the leaders of the 150 largest corporations in America formed the Business Roundtable in response to Powell's memorandum. At the time that Powell wrote, the National Association of Manufacturers had their headquarters in the Middle West. They moved their, their headquarters to Washington. Uh, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is the organization of small businesses, had 3,000 members. By 1980, it had 600,000 members. At the time that, that Powell wrote, only 175 American businesses had offices in Washington even to talk to the, the government, let alone uh, to lobby the government. Eight years later, there were 2,425 businesses that had offices in Washington. They all got the message, get to Washington, start doing your lobbying. 50,000 people were working for business trade associations in Washington by 1980. There were 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists, 130 lobbyists for every single member of Congress. There were 8,000 corporate PR people. This was Powell's army. That's my nickname for it. it, was never known as that. Now I gotta tell you, I was running the Washington Bureau of the New York Times at the late 1970s. I didn't know anything about the Powell Memo. I had never heard of it. None of my reporters had ever heard of it. I gave a speech not long ago to a bunch of journalists in Washington, Bob Schieffer of CBS, uh, Jim Lehrer of, of, uh, of PBS, uh, Mark Shields, Washington Post columnist, people like that. There was only one other reporter in the room today who had ever heard of the Powell Memo besides me. So this happened under our radar. It, it never registered. But we saw the impact of it. Because in the Congress of 1978, Powell's army came out and they had a direct impact. That is, they've changed the landscape of power in Washington then and we're living with it today. What happened then is affecting us today. It is affecting the debate that's going on now. It is affecting the way Paul Ryan's budget was drafted. It is with us today. So that's why it's important to understand this. 1978, organized labor hoped to get a couple of laws that would make it easier for, for labor to, uh, to organize unions in, 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 in uh, parts of the country where, where they had not done very well. Ralph Nader was looking to get a Consumer Protection Bureau established. Those things got bottled up in Congress. The lobbying army that, that Powell had triggered simply ate them up. They never got out of Congress. 
In 1978, the 401k plan was written into law. I've already told you the importance of the 401k plan. They began to get deregulation of the trucking and the telecommunications industry. Uh, they changed the corporate bankruptcy law in ways that left the old management of the bankrupt corporation in charge of the company. And so when you saw the steel industry, LTV Steel, uh, uh, Republic Steel, uh, all the steel companies, Wirt and Steel, starting to go bankrupt in the late 90s, the labor agreements were written and, and the, the workers lost all kinds of benefits in management, state, and control. And then you saw it in the airline industry, United, Delta, now it's American Airlines, uh, Eastern Airlines, Continental, ran right through the airline industry. Same kind of thing happened. In my book, I follow the bankruptcy of United Airlines, and in the United Airlines bankruptcy, people like Paul O'Neill, lots of them, tens of thousands of them, they lost cumulatively $4 billion in benefits and, and in wages and so forth. So the changes of the laws in 1978 were important. In 1978, Congress also got rid of the limits on interest rates. Up until that time, states had, had laws called usury laws, which put limits on, on what rates banks could charge for mortgage loans, for car loans, for student loans, for credit card, so on and so forth. There was a law passed that year that got rid of the limits, and that actually set up the framework for the subprime crisis that occurred in the late 1990s, 2000. So a lot of things happened. And the last important thing happened, happened to the tax law. Now understand, tax law is the most political law there is in America. Don't take my word for it. I quote Wall Street lawyers and so forth in my book talking about it. It is because it's all about winners and losers. And usually it's about the fine print and it's very difficult for ordinary people and sometimes very difficult for journalists to understand exactly what's being done because the language is so tricky and it's written by tax lawyers who spend their lives figuring out how to do things in ways that other people can't understand but work to the benefit of their clients, okay? I mean, that, that's basically what's going on. Um, Jimmy Carter wanted to actually closed some of the loopholes on the wealthy when he came into office. He wanted to drop some poor people uh, from the tax rolls, and he wanted to raise the corporate tax rate to help bring the budget uh, back into balance. By the time Powell's army and the Congress got done with it, the tax law went in exactly the opposite direction. None of the loopholes were closed on the wealthy. None of the lower income people were dropped from the tax rolls. The corporate tax rate didn't go up 2% as Carter wanted. It went down 2%. Now, the amount is not what matters. The direction is what matters. Up until then, for two or three decades, taxes have been going up. Now the taxes were going down on, on corporations. And the biggest change of all was the capital gains rate was dropped from 48% to 28%. And we're talking about the ta capital gains rate today. The single biggest change in the capital gains rate in America in the last half century occurred in that Congress of 1978. Now, Anybody who invests and has a capital gain benefits from the lowering of the capital gains rate. But you should know that the top 1% of income earners in America garner 50% of the capital gains from the stock market for the whole nation. So the top 1% benefits by far the most from lowering of the capital gains rate, okay? So all those things happen. I, I knew Arthur Levitt at that time, who was, uh, uh, president of the American Stock Exchange, a friend of mine, he and I went to the same college. And I said, Arthur, what's going on here? He said, what's going on is that business has found that politics matters, that if we get organized, we can get what we want. And we're going to be back, we're going to want more and we're going to be coming back for more. And they have been doing it. They've been coming back for more and more. If you flash, I could tell you stories and there are lots of them in my book, but I'll jump forward quickly just to the, to the aftermath of the banking crisis that we went through 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009. And they're trying to write a law to write banking regulations so we don't have the same thing again. So we, the taxpayers, don't have to spend $700 billion again to bail out the Wall Street banks that got us in trouble by running too high a risk. And they didn't want the controls. The banks hired over 1,400 former members of Congress former staffers on the key tax writing committees in Congress, and former officials who'd worked in the Treasury Department and regulatory agencies that regulated the banks to lobby to water down that bill. And that bill was severely watered down so that today uh, it, it has not had the effect and is not giving us the protection we want. And by the way, they have been lobbying ever since the law was passed, 
and you all, most of us, haven't been paying any attention, and the rules that are necessary to implement that law have never been issued yet because we're still arguing. And it's to the advantage of the banks to keep the argument going on forever. So the lobbying that got started back with Powell's army has been carried forward into one arena after another, oil companies, energy companies, uh, and banking industry most profoundly. So that was one thing that has affected the middle class, and it is affected in terms of policy. The tax rates have come down on people at the top, and the tax rates on the bottom and the middle have gone up. Everybody who works pays the payroll tax. While the tax rates at the top were coming down, the payroll tax was doubled from 3.5% to 7.65%. Doesn't sound like much, but if you're making $50,000 a year as a family, that's a big bite out of your income, okay? Uh, the estate tax has come down. The minimum wage has not kept up with inflation or average wages. So the protections at the bottom have not kept up with the, with the rising standard of living and the rising cost of living. And the taxes and the benefits at the top have been coming down to the benefit of, of the uh, top 1%. Top 1% from the Reagan tax cuts benefits a trillion dollars a decade. A trillion dollars a decade. Three decades of tax cuts, that's $3 trillion. The tax cuts by George W. Bush benefited the top 1%, another trillion dollars. So their income was in increased by $4 trillion through those actions. It runs through all kinds of policies. That's what happened in Washington. But what happened in the economy? Something very profound and important. The business ethos that I was talking to you about, the idea of stakeholder capitalism, got replaced by shareholder capitalism. Milton Friedman wrote a book called Capitalism and Freedom, Freedom. and Friedman is Capitalism and Freedom, written by Milton Friedman, if I can get that out right. <laughs> Shouldn't talk too fast. Um, <clears throat> he's a Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago, and he basically said, in, in these words, the mission of the CEO is to, return, is to generate the maximum return for the shareholders. In other words, your job is to make sure that the Biggest return goes to the shareholders. There's two ways to pay shareholders. One way is to work the, t the price of the stock of your company up, and the other way is to pay big dividends. And, and basically, you do that by generating major profits. If you're generating major profits, there's a tension between profits and wages. If you're gonna move profits up, you're gonna hold wages down, you're gonna cut the workforce, or you're gonna, you're gonna freeze wages. So guess what happened? From 1975 to 2011, Remember, I told you 45 to 75, productivity went up 97%, average income went up 95%. All right, let's move forward. Now, from 75 to 2011, the productivity of the American workforce went up 80%, and the pay at the middle of the American economy went up 10%. 80% and 10%. Where did all that money go? Where did all that money go? At the very middle, the Census Bureau told us last year, that the average male worker in America in 2011, adjusted for inflation, earned exactly the same hourly pay and benefits as in 1978. 78 to 2011, three decades of going nowhere at the middle, okay? The average CEO of a major Fortune 500 company, pay went up 350%, the income of the people at the top went up 600% during that same period. Okay, so we got, this is what I call wedge economics. A wedge gets driven into the American economy, and above that wedge, people are doing really well, and right at that wedge, they're going nowhere. But guess what? It's still going on. In the four years since the bottom of our current recession, corporate profits, the New York Times reported this last week, corporate profits have gone up 20% a year, actually 20.1% a year. The incomes of average Americans right in the middle has gone up 1.4% per year in the same period. We have the stock market hitting records every day, and we have 22 million people looking for full-time work, okay? 14 million don't have work, and 8 million are working part-time, and they want full-time work, and they can't find it, okay? So we've got this tremendous gulf, and how we got there, Basically, we got there through stock options, and we got there through the decisions of, of corporate leaders to take more and more and more of the share of, the, of corporate profits for themselves and for their shareholders. Um, so we're at, we're, at a, we're at a terrible state here where we've had this going on now for three decades. 
Middle class is not making more money. The cost of medical care has gone up. The cost of college tuition has gone up. The cost of homes went up for a long time. It's gone down, but it's still well above where it was back in 1980. The major costs in life, the cost of retirement has gone up. We, we have a baby boomer generation that, that half of which is headed for poverty and retirement, and we haven't even faced that issue nationally. So we have a middle class that is in serious trouble. And we have a political system that is absolutely broken. It is stymied with polarization. I'll get into the causes of that in a minute. But let me just share with you something that was, was said about a century ago by Louis Brandeis before he went on the Supreme Court. He said, we must make our choice. We may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Now, economists are telling us, very good economists and economic studies are telling us, that the best way to have growth is when incomes are closer together, the period of the Great Compression. And that, in fact, high inequality of income is demonstrably destructive to and a drag on economic growth. So not only is the 1%, 99% dichotomy unfair and offensive to us and our democratic notion of the land of opportunity. By the way, we're no longer the land of opportunity. People can move up the scale uh, in other countries much faster than they can in America today, which did not used to be the case 20 or 30 years ago. But not only is, is, does it offend us and our notion of equal opportunity, not equality, but equality of opportunity, but it's bad for the country's growth. So we need to fix it. So what do we do? I got finished with the first draft of my book, and um, my editor, Kate Medina, said to me, Rick, you've described a pretty bad situation. You've got us all in a ditch. You've got to get us out. <laughs> I said, well, if the president of Congress can't get us out, I don't know how I'm going to do it single-handedly. She said, well, you've got to at least explain it. I said, Kate, I'm a reporter. My job is to go out and report, analyze things, tell people the facts, let them work it out, let the policy wonks figure it out. She said, no, you got to do more. I said, no, I'm not going to do more. And then my wife, who's my first editor, Susan, who should be here tonight, Susan Zox, she's the person, she said, Kate's right, you got to do it. So I did it. <laughs> so, so at the end of my book, you've got Hedrick Smith's handy dandy 10 point program for saving America. And I'm glad you're laughing because I feel awkward about being a policy advocate, okay? But it's not that hard to figure out some things to do. It really isn't. Um, I, these are not my ideas. I, I, I looked around and, and, and looked at things I thought were intelligent. I didn't care who the authors uh, were and I didn't care what their party they, they came from. We have a tax system that's crazy. Companies that move jobs overseas pay a lower tax rate than companies who operate entirely in the United States. That doesn't make sense. We want to keep the jobs in America. Uh, we have an H-1B visa program, which allows companies to import engineers and computer people and so forth with bachelor's degrees. These are not the best and the brightest in the world. Now, these are not world geniuses. These are just people with bachelor's degrees and pay them less than Americans. And Microsoft is 40 percent of Microsoft's workforce up in the state of Washington either has green cards or has H-1B visas. They're taking jobs away from, from Americans that are, that are qualified for the jobs. People like Christine Serrano who actually prepare themselves for the jobs. It's crazy to, to do that. Um, the Chamber of Commerce says that the roads, bridges, ports, airports in America are literally costing us a trillion dollars in growth. We are not competitive globally. The Chinese have more modern rail systems than we do. In America today, it takes more time to move a freight train through the city of Chicago than it does to drive it all the way from Los Angeles to Chicago because the rail lines in Chicago are so antiquated they can't move. And I was talking to somebody today who lived in Chicago said, said well, I used to have to commute in Chicago. Take me, I'd part from one part of Chicago to another part of Chicago. It'd take me an hour on the L to do that. This is crazy. We're wasting enormous amounts of time. We're not educating enough kids. So we should update our transportation system. If we did that, we'd give business to the American steel business. We'd give work to, to American workers. We'd invest in our future the same way businesses invest in their future and families invest in their future. We support the kids. Uh, it, it, we do something to bail out the homeowners. We got 10 or 12 million homeowners who are stuck in the same old bubble era loans 
And the whole idea of bailing out the banks was that the banks were going to bail out the homeowners. The job stopped halfway done. We bailed out the banks and they said, no, we don't want to do it. We're making more money from people who are paying those old 9% loans. If we refinance them today at 35 or 4%, we'd be making less money. I'm sorry, folks. We bailed you out. Isn't it fair that you bail out the other people? There are things like that. But we're going to have to fix the political system first. I don't think these things are going to get done in any significant way unless we do that. Um, the last elections really demonstrate the, the, some of the problems. We have a system that is way too party-centered. There are a few states that have begun to, to experiment with opening up. We've, we've lost the political middle. They can't reach agreements in Washington because there's nobody to bridge the divide. They're extreme left and they're extreme right, and they control the debate. And people who try to edge toward the center, you see it happen. You're seeing it happening right now. And every time it looks like there's a little bud on the rose, out come the extremists on both sides, and they kill it. It happens because of the way we set up our elections. We have gerrymandered districts all over the country, in Missouri, in Massachusetts, in Texas, in California, anywhere you want. More people voted for the Democratic candidates for the House of Representatives this past fall than voted for Republican candidates, but the Republicans have a 33-vote majority in the House of Representatives. They didn't earn it. They gerrymandered the districts. Now, they're not alone in doing it. The Democrats are doing it, too. In the states they control, they're doing it to get them back. We need to get honesty back to our elections and have somebody, not in the party, retired federal judges, academicians, somebody who's much politically neutral. Nobody's perfectly politically neutral, of course, but more politically neutral than the governor and the legislature that just got elected in whatever state you're in. And if we came closer, the dynamics of the debate today about what to do with America's future would be very different. You'd have either a three or four vote Republican majority in the House or a three or four vote Democratic majority. The argument would be much less polarized. And guess what? All those gerrymandered districts are districts that were designed to be safe either for Republicans or Democrats. And even when the Republicans are in control, I don't know the politics of Missouri, but in lots of states, the party that's in control will say, well, there's nothing we can do about Kansas City. So we'll give the Democrats three or four safe seats in, 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 in Kansas City, and we'll take all the rural, rural seats around there, and we'll design the districts so we have safe seats and they have safe seats. Guess what happens? When you have safe seats, the other party doesn't bother to go out and vote. The moderates in the parties don't bother to go out and vote. So you get more and more extreme candidates on each side. And when they get to Washington, they can't even talk to each other. So if we could change the gerrymandering, if we could open up the political primaries to everybody, then there'd be more pressure for the politicians and the political uh, strategists to vote for and shoot for the middle. At the moment, what do you do if you're running a campaign? You do everything you can get, get your base angry at the other side, and you do everything you can to the other side to suppress their vote. That's a crazy way for democracy to work. We need people to get involved and come out and vote and to encourage people to vote. Yes, people are going to disagree. They should on the issues. But it's a very different kind of politics that we have today. But fundamentally, you and I, the you and I's all over this country are going to have to get involved in the same way people were in the environmental movement and the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the consumer movement. We're going to have to say, this is intolerable. We're shipping jobs overseas. The banks got bailed up, but they're not bailing out the homeowners. The tax system isn't fair. We need to change this. We need to get to the moment that Rosa Parks got to in 1955 when she said Jim Crow isn't fair. She sat down in the front of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and they said, lady, I probably didn't say lady, but they said, you've got to go to the back of the bus. She said, I'm not going to the back of the bus. This isn't fair. A lot of other people wouldn't go to the back of the bus. Then they boycotted the buses. Then I met John Lewis and other people in Nashville, and they wanted to eat at the lunch counters. You just want to eat a Coke and a hamburger the same way anybody else can. And then I met the Freedom Riders. And then I saw Martin Luther King at the March on Washington. 50th anniversary is coming up this year, August 28, 2013. The man not only got up and said, I have a dream, and think of the words, I have a dream. We think of the March on Washington and the environmental movement as a protest movement, but they're movements of great idealism. These were people who believed that they, as individuals and collectively, we could make America a better place. So we have both protest and idealism at work. We need that same spirit today. 
The man not only said, I have a dream that one day my little daughters can sit down with white boys and eat at the same table. He said, we have come here today to cash a promissory note from American democracy that all men and all women, yes, black men and black women, as well as white men and white women, are created equal and have a right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is a spirit that says, let us live up to the best in us. Ladies and gentlemen, if you expect Washington to fix itself, if you talk about politics and say they got to change this, every time you find yourself saying they, stop the sentence. Turn it around and put the word we in it and finish the sentence. It may not say the same thing. It may not be about the same thing. But if we don't get the we into American democracy, we're not going to get it back, and we are going to be on the downhill slide as a civilization. Thank you very much. Too long. Let me ask them, answer yeah, some we'll, questions. We'll, we'll, we'll take questions. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll take questions. We don't have microphones uh, tonight, so please speak up. Please, no speeches or very short speeches. And then would you repeat the sure. question? Sure, uh, I'll be happy. To. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I got cranked up, as you can tell, um, and I talked a little bit too long. So this is going to last a little longer than you uh, built for me. Yes, sir. Back there. You, sir. Right. Basically, that when the upper classes followed that, get enough control that they could rig the game on their own behalf, that's the tipping point where free societies come to, begin to come to an end. Can you comment on that? Sure, before? absolutely. Did you all hear it? Uh, last year, a book came out, Why Nations Fail, by an MIT professor, and I forget who the other one was, which essentially said that nations fail at the point where the dominant elite, uh, I'm sorry, they didn't use that phrase. That's a phrase I'm going to use in a minute. Uh, where the people, the powers that be, essentially get too much power and they operate the society in their own benefit. Uh, my book actually begins with Arnold Toynbee, the great British historian who wrote A Study of History, which is a study of 21 civilizations over 6,000 years of human history. And he makes the same point in a slightly different way. What he says is that at the flowering of a new culture, and we think of this as the, the era of the founders of America, the 18th century and the early, early 19th century, uh, the country is led by a creative elite, which is creative in all kinds of ways, uh, not just in terms of art and, and letters, but creative in terms of the form of government, creative in terms of the economy, creative in terms of the notion of where the society can go. And the society gets in trouble years later, centuries later, whatever, when the creative elite becomes the dominant elite, that's his phrase, same thing as why nations fail. When the dominant elite becomes concerned with increasing its own power and wealth at the expense of the rest of the society, it is not only, it is the beginning of the end of that society unless that is reversed. That, that is certainly an idea I would agree with, and uh, I'll rest on Toynbee and his study of 21 civilizations. Yes, sir? No. Right. Don't we need constitutional reform? Um, 
I don't know if I can get all the preamble of the question in. Uh, we had a creative elite at the time the Constitution was written. We had another creative elite in the wake of uh, World War II, and we had a lot of people, I guess, with the GI Bill, people uh, getting better education and so forth. Don't we need constitutional reform? Um, yes, uh, yes, but, but we can do a lot without constitutional reform. And let me just give you an example. I mean, a lot of people ask me at sessions like this about Citizens United and the Supreme Court's decision, don't we need a constitutional amendment to restrict the power of institutions, particularly corporations, trade unions, and so forth, to give untold amounts of money in the political system. Yeah, we probably do, but you also could actually, if you could get a ruling by the Federal Election Commission that required the disclosure of all the donors to 501c4s, and you probably don't know what they are, but they're advocacy groups that are like 501c3s. You can give to them. They're charitable, but they can actually advocate causes, whereas 501c3s can only do uh, social work, welfare work, and education. At the moment, the FEC has ruled the donors do not have to be disclosed. If they change that ruling, that money would dry up overnight. I've talked to wealthy donors and I've talked to their lawyers. And they said if those donors had to reveal who they were and what they were pushing, in most instances, they would go away. So there are a lot of things you could do. You can fix gerrymandering in Missouri or in Massachusetts or in Maryland, my longtime home state, without going to the Supreme Court. You can open primaries without doing that. Um, you, could, you could make it easier for people to vote. You could put voting day on a Sunday over a weekend instead of on a Tuesday so people were not working and voting at the same time. Guess who doesn't have time to go vote? Uh, people have to commute an hour and a half to work and work 10-hour days, and both of the father and the mother have to work and so forth. So if you made it easier, you'd get more voting. There are a lot of things we could do short of that. We may need some constitutional uh, amendments of one kind or another. Let me go over to this side over here. Yes, ma'am, way in the back. Yeah, what a great question. Um, could I comment on the use, arguably greater influence Justice Powell had as a justice on the Supreme Court, moving the court to make more pro-business decisions? Um, court, court, it sounds like a lawyer might be asking this question. <laughs> I'm a well, you're, you, well, then you got a very good legal brain. Um, um, the answer is no, I can't comment except generically because I really haven't studied the court decisions, but I have certainly read a number of articles that make the case that you are now making, that when Powell went on the court, there were also others who went on the court, but that there's no question that the Supreme Court from the mid-70s onward has, has overwhelmingly tended to back business interests when they run into the interests of workers and consumers in most of its decisions. Will you forgive me? You and I could talk about this for a long time. I do want to get to somebody else. I see you ready to ask a second question. Forgive me. I'm, I'm going to, there was somebody else over here. I want to be fair to this side of the audience. Yes, sir. Would you comment on the uh, Obama administration the first four years and then the campaign as well with Romney in terms of uh, protection of the middle class interest, which was such a theme that uh, Obama ran on in the first four years and then subsequently? Okay, when I comment on the Obama administration's first four years, I thought, well, we can spend the rest of the evening on that. Um, uh, and then the campaign, but in terms of, of protection of middle class. I have to tell you that, that uh, I spent a lot of time as a correspondent in Moscow, and that may not sound relevant to American politics, but what you learn to do is you really learn to watch behavior and you compare behavior and words, because we didn't have a lot of access to the Soviet leadership when I was there, so we had to learn to read between the lines. I kept expecting in the first term that the president would say, I'm pursuing a middle class agenda. The stimulus is to try to generate middle class jobs. Believe it or not, the health care program is intended to provide more health protection and more access, particularly for people who have pre-existing conditions for the middle class. And the effort to regulate the banks and to set up a consumer protection bureau is, is, is for the middle class. 
president never did that. He never did what I call thematic politics. I think that, that book writers, artists, uh, politicians, businesses, people need to convey themes so that uh, masses of people understand what they're about. And I think one of the president's significant failures in his first term, and I keep watching to see whether or not it's going to emerge in this, I haven't seen it yet, is to talk thematically so people understand that. He does better when he's in the campaign than when he gets in the White House. In some ways, he's too good a student. He's too serious a student. What's the legal, practical problem I have to fix? And you get, you get this jumping, odd hocusm from one thing to the next, and we don't have any sense of connection, like the New Deal, like the Fair Deal, like the New Frontier of other presidents, okay? So I think, it's, it, I think that's been one of his impulses. But he's also been rather, believe it or not, respectful of Wall Street. And he's worried about balancing the budget, and he wants to get gun control, and he wants to do immigration. He's all over the lot. It's all over the lotism. I think it's much harder to argue that he's clear about this agenda than I thought he was from the 2008 campaign and the 2012 campaign. Somewhere in here. Anybody in here? Yes? Could you uh, reflect on the impact of the two-party system? I have to reference that I grew up in Denmark, and last time I voted, there was 15 parties. Yeah. Only uh, when the, uh, the people that get 5% of the vote gets into the parliament. So six to eight parties get in, and there's never a majority. It forces them to work together, and in particular, that everybody that turns 18 are registered to vote the government believes in its system, so that between 60-some percent and 80-some percent of that eligible pool actually votes, so it's a people's support. Okay. What would that do? Well, you've, you've raised two or three issues at once in the guise of raising one issue. But that's what I do, too, uh, whenever I get a chance to ask a question. This gentleman from Denmark says, what about uh, a multi-party system as we have in Denmark? We have multiple parties uh, represented in the Congress, in, in their legislature, in their parliament, which forces people to work together. And you also then threw in the idea that, that there was a high voter turnout in Denmark, which is very important. Let's do voter turnout first. There are countries in the world, Australia among them, not just Scandinavia, uh, which actually fine people for not voting, and the fine goes up each time you don't vote. So the fine gets higher. They get very high percentage, okay? In addition to that, they hold the voting on a weekend, or if they don't hold on the weekend, they declare a national holiday so people can actually vote. And then now we've gotten to mail balloting and that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think our problem has been two parties versus multiple parties. I went back to American history just 30 years ago, which is not that long ago. We had two parties, and there were all kinds of compromises. I mean, without regard to the merits of the issue, in 1965, when Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, proposed Medicare, there was an alternative Republican plan in both the House and the Senate that was actually very close to his plan. 65 Republicans in the House voted for Nixon's plan, 13 prominent Republican senators voted for his plan, and his successor, Richard Nixon, a Republican, proposed a subsequent Medicare reform that was more radical than the one that Obama proposed in 2009, and it got zero Republican votes. So I don't think it's the two-party system. I believe it's the way we now operate the two-party system. It's become extreme. There was a time political scientists have actually plotted on charts. They've made Rorschach charts of the votes of members of the two parties in Congress historically on key issues in each legislative session. If you go back to the 1970s, the charts of the Democrats and the Republicans overlap. The most liberal Republicans and, uh, were to the left, uh, if you will, uh, of the most conservative Democrats. Over the years, these two things have separated, and they now, literally, there's a white space in between them. There's almost no overlap. So it wasn't the two-party system. There was a time when it worked the way you're describing the Danish parliament. Okay? Yes, a couple more. A couple more. Thanks. Yes, sir. I think everybody heard that remark. <laughs> no, it's a very interesting question. 
All right, a question. I was talking about movements. The gentleman said you were talking about movements. Pause. Guillotines are quicker. <laughs> and then the final question was, are we there yet? It's very interesting. You're, you're, the, you're probably the fifth or sixth person that's asked me something like that. I was speaking up in Long Island at the Shelter Rock Unitarian Universalist Church, which is, I would have thought, a fairly pacifist kind of place. <laughs> And a guy got up and, and, and uttered some very liberal, progressive, leftist remarks, and he said, and I just want to tell you, I'm going to keep my gun for the revolution. <laughs> I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, well, they clearly, I think, I, actually, I think people are playing with fire in this country. I think there's a great deal of anger. There's a great deal of frustration. At the moment, we're passive as a people because we still haven't gotten our political courage back, our political self-confidence. Friend of mine, Ernie Cortez, who's an organizer in the Southwest, uh, brilliant guy, one, a very smart guy and a wonderful organizer, he, says, he said once, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, powerlessness also corrupts. It corrupts democracy at the core. If we believe we are powerless, we don't exercise our power. Yes, it does take time to get involved in these movements, but ladies and gentlemen, I believe the hour is late and I believe the stakes are high. I started out really as a reporter, but, but I've, I've become really very passionate about this. I'm very concerned about this country. I care about it a great deal. I think there are wonderful things about America. There are enormously talented people, but we simply have got to get engaged. We cannot sit still any longer. It's gone beyond that. And it's not a point of getting angry. It is a point of saying, look, the housing thing isn't fair. The tax thing isn't smart. Uh, you know, the number of these things, the elections aren't fair. I mean, the political system is just corrupted to hell, and we need to go back and do some basic things to repair it. Back there, the younger fellow. That young guy back there. <laughs> I represent two businessmen who started the company 20 years ago. They built the company up at 9,000 employees. They paid hundreds of millions of dollars in local, state, and federal taxes. But according to the logic of your book, they have contributed to income inequality. They have widened the gap between rich and poor. They've increased the concentration of wealth. I, 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 I don't know that. You haven't told me enough about the story. I can tell you that about the heads of GE or GM and so forth. I don't know what those guys have done. They're American capitalists, and I cite them in my book who still operate on the basis of stakeholder capitalism. I just had a meeting last week with Klaus Kleinfeld. I'll let you go on, but let me just say, I just had a meeting last week with Klaus Kleinfeld, who's the CEO of Alcoa. And every time he finds a product that can be produced more cheaply overseas because of labor costs, he sits down with people in his workforce to try to devise a new product and raise their skills so they can produce it in order to protect the jobs. That is not the norm in America. I don't know what you, uh, your buddies do. If they do that, I'm all for them. They make high-tech, manufacturing, well-paid jobs with generous benefits to the workers. But because they accumulate wealth, your book assumes that they are inimical and hostile to the middle class. No, it does not. Uh, all right, wait, 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 all right. I, let me, let me, uh, sorry. Let me repeat the gentleman's question if that was a question. Um, um, this gentleman, I'm sorry, was it you or is it two friends of yours? All right, two clients of his created a business several years ago, some years ago. Uh, they produce high tech goods. Uh, they now have 9,000 employees, is that correct? I got to know, you know, you want to have an argument, I want to have a discussion, okay? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know enough facts. I'm not prepared to judge on that. If they do what you said they do, which is they've paid their people well, they have given them generous benefits, and they've generated these jobs, then I'm all for them. And I, but I don't think... No, wait a second. No, they may not have done it at the expense of the middle class. You're a, pardon me? 
Yes, you would know that from, have you read my book? Well, uh, then you better go back and read it a third time. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I like to go on and talk with you further about it. I, I, I literally cite Bob Galvin. I, I, I just mentioned Klaus Kleinfeld. I cite a number of people who do the kinds of things you're talking about who are practicing stakeholder capitalism. I'm for stakeholder capitalism. I'm not against it. I'm for that part of capitalism. But the people who practice shareholder capitalism, who are taking the wealth for themselves and for their shareholders at the expense of their workers, I'm against that. To be clear, yes, sir. This is the last question. Okay. Okay, I have a question, and I really like the premise of your book. The question is this What is the easiest thing that we can do in a relatively short amount of time to begin to put the we back in we the people? All right, what, what are the things that, in a relatively short period of time, the problems took 30 years to, to do, to get into. You're not going to get it done in a short period of time. So if your attitude is you've got to do it in a short period of time, the answer is nothing. Okay? So don't kid yourself. You've got to be engaged, and you've got to be engaged for a long time to come. All right? There is an organization today called Fair Elections. And their whole effort is to try to make the elections in America fair, whether they're talking about money, influence in politics, gerrymandered system, open primaries or not. If you're interested in that issue, you can go get in touch with them. There's another movement called Take Back the American Dream. You can get involved in that. They're involved in all kinds of issues. They're trying to, they're, they're trying to deal with uh, benefits for veterans who've come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, having trouble uh, getting work here in America, try to support them, try to get legislation that will protect them. There are people who are trying to protect the Medicaid program, the Medicare program. You can get involved with that. MoveOn.org has got a whole slew of different organizations coming off from them. So I mean, you can go on the internet practically pick any issue that you're interested in, write the words in, and you will find there's some organization at work on that. Now, what isn't going on, what is going on is a lot of traffic on the internet. What isn't going on is people actually getting out and showing in a mass how they feel. What isn't going on is several thousand people who have been wrongly foreclosed out of their homes. And the banks have paid tens of billions of dollars of penalties for having wrongly foreclosed people out of their homes, they never showed up on the mall. If you go back in American history, when that happened, people showed up on the mall in Washington and said, this is intolerable, and Congress responded. So people are gonna to have to start banding together and making, making themselves visible. I don't know what the issues are. I certainly know the issue of gerrymandering is important one, one here. It's important in every state in the union. The issue of open uh, political primaries is important. The, the issue of making voting easier for people so you get a higher participation of voting, that's an issue everywhere. Leveling the tax playing field is certainly an issue people can get involved in. There are people working on those issues, and you can find them on the internet, but we have to start acting. And it, hasn't, it has to be more than just the kids in Occupy who didn't have an agenda, who didn't have a leadership, who couldn't go beyond the protest, which was a valid and important protest, that there was an unequal balance between uh, the wealthy, the 1% and the 99%. Uh, we need to fill in that agenda so that we can rally more people and so that the power structure, the establishment, can actually negotiate and say, fine, what do you want to change about the banks? What do you want to do here? Do you want to break them up? Do you want to put a limit on them? Do you want to, do you want to have a financial tax? I mean, how do you want to curb their power? By the way, historians will show you that there are two indicators of a danger time or three indicators for a danger time for a civilization. One, it was the dominant elite, which is the question that came up before. Another is when you see the rise of the financial sector growing faster and accounting for more, a larger percentage of the GDP than the productive sector. That happened in Spain, it happened in Holland, it happened historically. That's almost always an indicator. And the other indicator is when you're spending too much on the military. A fellow named David Kennedy wrote a book called, uh, called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. And his thesis was that when you get to the point of military overstretch, when you're spending more on your military and you're projecting more power far away from your own homeland than your economy can sustain, that is the beginning of the turndown of a civilization. 
I want to believe we can turn up. I want to believe that people can start companies like this gentleman just mentioned, uh, you know, by his two friends several years ago, and employ more people and come up with products that work and that sell around the world and that generate jobs and that generate opportunity for people. And if that's what these guys are doing, more power to them. I don't, I'm not against that. I'm for that. We did that. We did that effectively. We need to get back to that sense of balance, that sense of fairness, that sense of sharing, that sense that we're actually one family. If we operate not like a dysfunctional family, but a functional family, we'd be a lot better off. But we have to get engaged. Thank you very much. Friends at Rainy Day have the book for sale right here, uh, and Hedrick Smith will uh, sign your books uh, in the cafe. You'd line up there. Thank you very much.